Good evening, everyone, or good day, wherever you are. It's currently about 1 p.m. for me, so hello to everyone in every relevant time zone. Uh, before I start, obviously, let me extend my thanks to the ESS and to Laura and David particularly for organizing this whole presentation. And thank you to Dennis for taking care of the details with the Zoom talk and all of that jazz. Now, the work that I'm going to present today is a small section of my overall PhD research. So in the big picture, I'm interested in the development of the major and minor settlements across northern Egypt, as well as the Sinai Peninsula and the Libyan coast. So for those unfamiliar, traditionally settlement studies in Egyptology do tend to focus on the Nile Valley. We have you know, wonderful sites like Amarna, Deir al Medina, and uh, many others to really record Egyptian towns. I'm more interested in the north, particularly the Delta and that Sinai periphery area. So for my PhD research, I'm focusing on the New Kingdom with an emphasis particularly on Dynasty 18, which is my specialty, and a little bit of Dynasty 19 and 20 as well. So just to give you a rough idea of where this is going, the sort of the chronological period between around 1450 BCE and 1250 BCE is particularly fascinating for settlements and urbanism in northern Egypt. There is a lot of change, a lot of developments and redevelopments across the region over this time period. So my PhD studies are interested in identifying, documenting and explaining some of the major trends that seem to be occurring. And today I'm going to give you a small section of what I've been working on. I'll preface this with the usual caveat, since this is, you know, PhD research, the discussion is preliminary and my ideas are going to change as the project develops. So with that in mind, let's get started, so to speak. So we'll start with the obligatory Jean-Claude Gauvin image, which is P. Ramesses sometime in the late 13th or 12th centuries BCE. We're viewing the city from the southwest, looking downriver towards the north. In the foreground, right in the center of, and center right of this uh, image, we see two major islands that are part of the older city, which is Avaris or Tel El Daba. I'm going to come back to that later as the main sort of focus of this talk, but in the background on the left, we can see the urban center of Pyramuses itself, which is the modern town of Kantir. And between these two centers, we find a really important feature, which are multiple waterways and channels of the Nile. This whole area is based on the Pelusiac branch, which is the major Eastern branch of the Nile at the time. Again, I'm going to cover the topography and its significance a bit later, but first I just wanna give a sense of the classic view of Pyramuses and this area overall. So Golvan's painting shows the city at its height when the institutions and the suburbs are full to bursting, ships navigate the river and presumably the streets are bustling. This is also the age when the texts that we have describe the city in its most grandiose and detailed form. And we do have a variety of references to Pyramuses as the urban center of the country. One of the better known descriptions of Pyramuses comes from the reign of Merenipita, the successor of Ramesses II, who reigned around 1220 BCE, give or take. In that period, a scribe composed a praise text to the city. And we find this text in Papyrus Anastasi III, and it gives a particularly vivid description of the physical and economic environment of the town. So first of all, the scribe extols the virtues of, quote, P. Ramesses, beloved of Amun, life, prosperity, health, a city which is at the forefront of every foreign land and the limit of Egypt, the beautiful city of balconies, radiant with halls of lapis lazuli and turquoise. Fairly standard stuff, you know, nothing too unusual. But then the scribe goes on and starts to describe more detailed facilities and their purpose. He calls P. Ramesses the marshalling place of your chariotry, that's the kings, the mustering place of your army and the mooring place of your ship's troops, which are either the sailors or the marines. The translation is adapted from Kaminos's uh, late Egyptian miscellanies, 
and it gives a good sense of the city's functioning in the later phases of settlement. By the reign of Meronipata, this area of Pyramuses and Avaris had become a major staging point for personnel, trade, transportation, and so forth. It was also the major site for production of military equipment. And another text from Papyrus Anastasi describes artisans in the royal workshops. And the author, author references, quote, the carpenters working on the chariots of Pharaoh, life, prosperity, health, which have been in their hands for the Feast of New Year's Day, or possibly since the Feast of New Year's Day. The coppersmiths are working on the chariot, which they bid be done anew, end quote. So basically at the height of P. Ramesses' prosper nah, prosperity, we find an overriding interest in the sort of military and industrial aspects of this community. This seems to fit with the popular image of the Ramesid kings as especially martial rulers. And it also fits with some of the archeology span of the site itself. So recently excavations by the Hildesheim expedition have uncovered the remains of a military workshop in this area. It seems that in the 19th dynasty, an industrial zone developed in Pyramuses. It was centrally controlled and located inside a palace complex. And the team identified tools of stone and copper, including items used for the manufacture of weapons, shields, and chariots. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty details of that, but broadly speaking, the archaeological material seems to confirm the basic accuracy of some of those Papyrus Anastasi texts. So recently the Hildesheim expedition has kind of strengthened that connection between the historical descriptions of Pyramuses and what is archeologically visible. Of course, there's always more work to do regarding the connections between these texts and other sites. But for now, I think we get a basic sense of some particular industries and operations in Pyramuses itself. And this gives us an idea of the city during the height of its occupation and activity. Now I've used P. Ramesses as the starting point to give a sense of how this area developed ultimately towards the latter stages of its career, if you will. For most of this presentation, I'm going to explore sites in this general area, and I'm going to focus on earlier settlements before P. Ramesses itself. The idea is to give a sense of how this region developed over time, what factors may have influenced it, and what this could tell us about larger trends in Egyptian history and settlement patterns. Now I've chosen to focus on the year 1300 BCE as a rough focal point. I'll discuss earlier developments and later, but overall I'm interested in that transitional phase between Dynasty 18 and Dynasty 19. For this zone in particular, uh, Avaris and Pyramuses, that transitional period is really juicy for archaeological, textual, and artistic data. So it offers valuable comparison points between different times and different places. As I've said, I'm going to cover material from earlier centuries as well, but broadly speaking, we're quite interested in that 18th dynasty and then 19th dynasty transition. So I have two main sites that I want to discuss today. These are Tel El Daba, AKA Avaris, and Tel El Borg, AKA the dwelling of the lion. These towns, along with Tel El Hebwa, mark some of the most significant settlements of the new kingdom in this region. I'm focusing on Tel El Daba and Tel El Borg because these sites are the best published. The work at Tel El Daba, I mean, sorry, Tel Heboa is ongoing and the publications are infrequent. So to date, most of the published material from Tel Heboa concerns the larger arch architectural features, the epigraphy and so forth. That's valuable, but since we're limited for time, I'm going to focus on the two sites that offer greater detail for understanding the micro and macro settlement patterns. So Tel El Daba and Tel El Borg, two sites or towns in the Eastern Delta and that Sinai periphery. They are both fortified or semi-fortified communities that operated in the 18th and early 19th dynasties. They operated in the same historical period and they were part of an economic network that connected various towns in this area. 
What's more, the architect, archaeological remains of these communities offer evidence for economic and cultural networks. And we also get a good idea of some geographical aspects. So looking at Tel Al Daba and Tel Al Borg together, hopefully I can give a sense of some broader trends in the 14th and 13th centuries BCE. Now, as I just alluded to, one of the major points of comparisons is the ancient paleogeography. In antiquity, these sites were more similar than you might expect. Tel Al Daba occupied a series of islands in the Nile estuary, and Tel Al Borg straddled a land bridge between a marshy lake in the south and the coastal environment in the north. Today, they are quite substantially inland with a lot of um, land reclamation and extension over the millennia. But in antiquity, they were both much closer to the coast, particularly Tel Al Borg. As I hope I will demonstrate, I think the geographical and topographical features of these sites are far more important to their urban history than previous generations of scholarship have argued. Now, recently, paleogeographical studies have greatly expanded our understanding of the environment in this region. Part of my discussion is going to explore how that environment may have impacted the physical development of these towns, specifically how it may have stimulated redevelopments or movements in the settled zones and across different historical points. So long story short, I'm going to focus on Tel Al Daba and Tel Al Borg with a particular focus on the archeological evidence for economic and cultural interactions the settlements themselves and their development, and how both of these may be influenced by the ancient geography. If everything goes according to plan, I should leave you with an overarching sense of how these areas developed historically and how recent scholarship is expanding our knowledge in certain key areas. So we begin with Tel El Daba. To set the scene, Tel El Daba developed on a pair of islands or geziras in the Eastern Delta. The city is located on the Pelusiac branch of the Nile, which runs from the main channel near Memphis up to the Mediterranean coast. Now, the Pelusiac was the artery for seagoing traffic in this region. And following this branch of the Nile, ships could access the Mediterranean Sea at most times of the year. There may have been a couple of months or a few weeks in the high summer where there was a discontinuation, but overall, they could access the sea from this branch. Now on their journey, if they were coming north or south towards Memphis, any ships would inevitably pass the area where Tel El Daba is located. So this site is well positioned. It had access to the sea, to the main river, and to the agricultural hinterland. It was ideally placed for movement, for transportation, and for the collection of resources. So perhaps it's no surprise that we find the earliest settlement emerging quite early, around 1890 BCE. The first traces of a town here date to the 12th dynasty, and at that time, a small settlement sprang up in the area F1, which you can see here in red. Now this town is a rectangular settlement surrounded by a wall with well-ordered streets. The houses are practically identical, the rooms of each are mirroring one another. Basically, the early Tel Al Daba settlement is another one of these planned settlements that we see in Dynasty 12, for example, at Lahun, Kahun, and Abydos. I'll come back to the early town in a moment, but first let's get a sense of the big picture. So why Tel Al Daba for a royal settlement? Now, the main reason for citing the town here, I think, is the Basin Harbour. The basin is probably the most important feature of Tel Al Daba as a settlement zone. It was accessible from the main river, thanks to this small channel on the left, K3, and it also had an outflow on the east. The basin was sheltered from the main river current, so it was a good place to load and unload boats, and it probably provided an easily accessible source of fresh water for the locals. Basically, I would suggest that this little basin, well, it's not little, but you know, this basin was the definitive feature of the town and possibly the main reason for its sighting in this area. Now, over time, this small settlement grew, and I will show a couple of major phases in a moment. 
Basically, between Dynasty 12 and 15, the site expanded into a major settlement hub, and residents gathered here from various cultural backgrounds, and the extension of domestic spaces indicate a large foreign population as well. The foreign demographics are slightly beyond the scope of my current talk, but long story short, the settlement in this region seems to have grown quite rapidly as a major crossroads of cultural and economic interaction. And once again, that would become one of the definitive features of the settlement. So going back to that planned town that appeared in Dynasty 12, you can see it here on the left. It's a small rectangular town. You've seen the type before probably. It has a wall surrounding it, nice identical orderly houses orthogonal streets and straight straight lines on, a, on either edge. The classic Dynasty 12 town, basically. Labi Pabachi, who was one of the initial uh, project leads at this site, characterized this early settlement as a, quote, farming town. And it's quite easy to imagine why. The site is located at a very good spot on the banks of the river. It has easy access to transportation and then to the wider agricultural zone. It's tempting to view this almost as a state organized settlement like a colony in the Eastern Delta. And some scholars have suggested that, particularly Nadine Moella, who in her study of urbanism, characterized settlements in this period as town planning and internal colonization at its height. So that's the basic starting point for the settlement as a whole, according to current archaeological data. Started well, nice small planned settlement, probably quite compact and dense, and serving a particular function that may have been agricultural or transportation, those sort of things. But very quickly, over a few generations, things started to change. First, the planned settlement only lasted for a few decades, and it was replaced by something more dynamic. Following the neat, tightly packed houses of the early town, we start to see something more expressive. We get larger houses, including a sort of mansion complex in the north, which you see here in the middle. This mansion seems to conform with some Near Eastern architectural styles. And again, that may reflect the emergence of a sort of foreign resident population. Again, that is slightly outside the scope of my talk, but the shift in the settlement pattern is really interesting at this time. But even that mansion phase did not last that long. Soon after, this area redeveloped again, and so uh, not too long after, we find it full of distinct separate estates. By around 1710 or so, we have large houses clustered together in a small village. Originally, they had streets in between, but very quickly they seem to have expanded and encroached on the public space and quickly filled it up. These estates show a steady growth in the physical footprint and internal organization of the settlement. They developed storage areas in their um, distinct compounds with separate kitchen facilities and family graves within the houses themselves. Again, those family graves within the domestic compound are a noticeably Canaanite or Near Eastern practice, and that may reflect the ongoing demographic changes in the area. So you can see here the steady growth of a few large houses. There's one estate in the middle of this diagram that more than doubled in size over just a couple generations. It went from a small three-room house and then expanded to basically cannibalize several others in the region. Now, these developments seem to be a relatively natural process, kind of an organic expansion, but as an urban or economic phenomenon, they are quite distinctive. One of the interesting features in the early settlement of Tel al-Daba seems to be a problem with space. The housing areas spread and then they condense quite rapidly as the population changes or grows. So the problem of congestion seems to be quite visible early on. And as we'll see later, this is going to be a recurring feature of Tel al daba as a whole. Now, following the Middle Kingdom phase, Tel al daba really takes off in the second intermediate period under the Hyksos. I am going to skim this slightly, but there are a couple of noteworthy features to mention. First, the settlement expands hugely. The urban sprawl may have reached up to 200 hectares, which is approximately 500 acres at, at its height. 
And the population could have reached as high as 30,000 plus, depending how you analyze the housing density. Basically, Tel al Dava was huge. And by the start of the New Kingdom, it was probably among the largest communities in Egypt. Now, at the onset of the New Kingdom, around 1530 BCE or so, or slightly earlier, we begin to find detailed references to the settlement called Avaris. In particular, the war stelae of Carmosa give us descriptions of the town's prosperity and some of its amenities. Carmosa claimed to have reached and plundered Avaris itself, and from his proclamations, he gives us a sense of the area's wealth. So Carmosa describes how, quote, I have destroyed your dwelling place, meaning the residence of the Hexos king. I have cut down your orchards. I have not spared a plank of the 300 ships of new cedar wood filled with gold, lapis lazuli, silver, turquoise, copper axes, blah, 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 blah. I took all of this away entirely, and I did not leave anything of a virus, for it was emptied out. So Carmosa's summary really fleshes out our understanding of the site as an economic hub. It seems that by this point, the city of Avaris, or Tel al Daba, had become a major harbor, able to accommodate hundreds of ships at a time, and those ships were bringing goods from across a wide region, particularly the Near East. In other words, a few centuries after its establishment, Tel al Daba seems to have become the stopping point for a wide-ranging trade network, and its harbor environment was central to the city's development and prosperity. Now, all of this kind of encourages us to recognize Tel al Daba as a city built first and foremost on its environment. Without that harbor, that central basin and the waterways around it, the town's importance probably would dwindle significantly. Broadly speaking, in, in urban studies, this is what you might call a single point of failure. It's an asset or a foundation that is absolutely crucial to the success of a project. For Tel Al Daba as a community, I would suggest that the existence of the harbor was everything, which perhaps as you've, going, as you've guessed, was going to become a problem in the future. So going back to the big picture of Tel Al Daba, we find a couple of significant changes during the second intermediate period and the early New Kingdom. First, that initial settlement, F1, disappears and is replaced by a temple precinct. Secondly, a new complex emerges. On the western bank of the Gezira, or island, we see... see a major royal foundation taking shape. This appears apparently during the Hexos period with a fortified or palatial complex near to the river. This fortress, quote unquote, features a buttressed wall and a garden of trees laid out in a grid. This orchard might be one of those orchards that Carmosa mentions in his stela, and it does seem to be contemporaneous with the wall. The two are following the same alignment, which is southwest to northeast. And some of the ceramic remains under the wall include Cypriot style pottery, which is really distinctive to this Middle Bronze Age period. Now, what's interesting is that this fortified complex provides some early evidence for the practice of land reclamation. So, this buttressed wall sits atop a layer of soil and sand that was deliberately dumped to create a new building ground. That soil and sand is atop a layer of settlement refuse, along with the remains of reed huts that might be the housing of builders or squatters. Either way, it seems to be an accumulation of material very quickly, and it provides an interesting example of the locals modifying the riverbank in order to accommodate a new construction. Now, unfortunately, this wall is only visible in its western and southern portions for now unless a substantial section has disappeared beyond the reach of the survey, which is always possible. It is possibly worth asking if the structure was primarily a barrier rather than a full-scale fortification. I'm purely speculating there. I don't want to put too much emphasis on that. 
but the layout of the surviving wall does seem to face quite strongly into the Nile River current. And this might indicate that the wall acted, or at least doubled, as a flood barrier during the season of inundation. So if we consider the local topography of this area, we would see that the annual flood likely washed up against the southern and western sides of the island. So this little fort is probably well placed to command the river frontage, but it would also be vulnerable to overflow in periods of high flooding. I do wonder if the arrangement of these forts atop a newly reclaimed area of land may be the result of environmental concerns as much as purely military purposes. Again, this is speculative, but it's possible that it's a major factor in the development of this structure. So around the 1560s, give or take, we see the locals developing the western areas of Tel El Daba in new ways. They were reclaiming land, expanding the available building space. They were planting and using the air enclosed area for orchards. And they were possibly building with an intent to protect the area from flooding. So this site provides our earliest glimpse at substantial redevelopments related to the local topography in the site. And it also marks the first of what was going to be a long series of large scale, almost state level redevelopments in this part of the town. So following the reconquest, if you will, the early 18th dynasty slowly began to reoccupy the site of Tel El Daba. Now, most notably, we see a major development beginning around an area called H6. A palatial complex emerges here around the time of Totmos III, which is approximately 1450 BCE. Now, initially, the excavation team interpreted this as a fortress, but they've since revised it to a palace complex. It seems that about three palaces, F, G, and J, rose up in a northwest to southeast orientation. They were constructed atop large podiums, which may have mimicked a sort of Near Eastern style. Or again, they may have doubled as flood barrier protections. Now the new complex overlaid the old Hexos one, suggesting that that was now defunct, and the palaces sat atop large platforms, which you can see. Superficially, this might suggest that the threat of flooding had receded, but geophysical survey has revealed another smaller wall enclosing a much larger area with a pylon gate on the north's eastern side. So this enclosure seems to be oriented similarly to the older Hyksos one. The south and western sides were secure against floodwaters, while the north and eastern sides may have acted as the primary entry points for the complex. Now this area, H1-6, offers two sets of material evidence that help us to understand the social, economic, and urban characteristics of the site. The first and most immediately engaging is the palace's decoration. So throughout the northernmost palace, which is Palace F, fragments of wall plaster revealed the decorative scheme that is quite obviously not Egyptian, but rather Cretan. We find a series of bull leaping motifs, which are principally found in the palaces of Knossos. These plaster fragments appeared in rubbish dumps near the northern palace, and it seems they were abandoned there after the site was redeveloped later in the 18th dynasty. Fortunately, they survived to the modern day in some capacity, and they were published in an extensive work by Manfred Bitek and his colleagues. Now, these scenes offer really vivid evidence of the city's cosmopolitan and international character. Tel El Daba had started as an Egyptian, possibly royal foundation, but over the centuries, the evidence for foreign cultural interaction ramps up quite significantly. To date, excavation has not identified a particularly Cretan housing quarter, but the existence of these scenes does make us wonder if there were expatriate artists, Cretans, living in the city, or at least visiting long enough to create a appropriate, uh, accurate series of murals. So between 1560, roughly, and 1400 BCE, Tel El Daba, or Avaris, experienced a real heyday of economic vitality. The city became a hub for trade with abundant harbor space, and apparently huge numbers of ships arriving and docking regularly, 
The population was diverse with Near Easterners, Egyptians and Southerners, i.e. Nubians living side by side. Artists of foreign heritage were producing work for the royal centers and the agricultural hinterland, both on the main islands and outside it, apparently produced a variety of foodstuffs and luxury goods for the community. So by all accounts, including some I haven't had time to cover, the city of Tal al Daba enjoyed roughly a century of economic prosperity. And the wealth that we find in this community seems to be greater than anything seen elsewhere in Egypt at the time. To be fair, that could be an accident of preservation, but it seems that by 1400 BCE, give or take, Tel al Daba could easily have been one of the wealthiest or at least most visibly wealthy communities in the country. A century later though, things had changed quite significantly. By 1300 BCE, the main urban area was declining. The population was moving northwards towards Kantir or Pyramises. Basically through the mid to late 18th dynasty and particularly the reigns of Tutmose IV and Amunhotep III, Tel el Daba starts to decline in prominence. By 1300 BCE, the main island of Tel el Daba had become predominantly a royal center. The housing suburbs were disappearing rapidly as the larger institutions either overlaid them or swallowed them up. And at the heart of the city, the Temple of Seth was one of the major developments. Again, this temple was not new, but it does grow substantially in size during this period. And it seems to suggest that the well, the domestic spaces were shrinking somewhat, or at the very least, the state may have been encouraging people to move so that it could build up its monumental space. So the palatial complex expanded significantly towards the end of the 18th dynasty. By this point, those old Tutmosid palaces were mostly gone. And they seem to be replaced by a couple of fortified spaces, one from the Amarna period, which is in yellow, and one possibly by King Horemheb, which is marked in blue. By now, the old domestic quarter, which was F1, lay under cemeteries of the late 18th and early 19th dynasties, and that's in red. Other burial grounds emerged in the southwest portion of the main island, and to the east across from the central city. The picture is slightly cut off here, but on the right, just where it turns to beige, you can see the beginnings of a Ramesid cemetery or Ram Sim. So all of this suggests that the central complex at Tel al Daba, this main core island was growing denser, at least in terms of the monumental structures. And that was pushing some of the amenities and the domestic space outwards into the periphery. Now this map was published in 2011, so it's not the most up-to-date depiction of the topography, but it does give us a general sense of the urban developments in this period. From a few, from a dispersed settlement with only a few state level complexes, the central island of Tel al Daba very quickly became an agglomeration of monumental constructions. Now because of this and some environmental developments I'm about to talk about, the city's older center changed in a big way. And in the next phase, which is the last I'm going to discuss, Tel al Daba underwent perhaps its greatest transformation yet. Unfortunately, it wasn't entirely positive. So in the mid to late 18th dynasty, the city of Tel al Daba experienced a rough decline, a rapid decline, I should say, in a, in a historical sense. After approximately 1400 BCE, the epigraphic and textual references to the city dry up. And there's a hiatus in the material record, suggesting that for a time, royal attention moved away from this city. Where that attention went and why it moved is a complicated question, but the break is actually only temporary. It lasts, lasts for approximately 50 years during the reigns of Tutmose IV and Amunhotep III. And by 1350 BCE, around the time of Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, and so forth, the city starts to pick up again a little bit. So it may seem like an inconsequential or tiny blip, but this lull in activity does occur at a transformative period for the site as a whole. <laughs> 
Soon after this hiatus finished, around 1300 BCE, Tel al Daba underwent the most significant of its transformations. And this time, the redevelopment actually led to the Egyptians partially abandoning the city and shifting the main settlement and royal attention northwards to the site that became Pyramuses. So over a period of approximately 50 years, we see Tel al Daba decline temporarily. But even when the activity resumed, it was short lived. And within a few more decades, the main settlements were moving northwards across the River Nile to a new site. Once this happened, the city of Tel al Daba or Avaris became less of an autonomous or independent community and more of a southern suburb to Pyramuses in the north. I'm going to suggest tentatively that these processes, a short decline followed by wholesale resettlement, actually stem from the same cause. Rather than being isolated developments or simply the product of political and military factors, it is possible that the declining fortunes of Tel al Daba actually have their roots in more geographical and topographical influences. Now, conventionally, explanations for Tel al Daba's decline and the shift to P. Ramesses do have a military or political focus. Ever since the 1920s, when Sir Alan Gardner studied the major settlements and fortifications of the Eastern Delta and Sinai Peninsula, scholars have devoted a lot of their attention to interpreting this area within the context of empire building, warfare, and politics. Fair enough, there's obviously plenty of that to go around, and it was certainly a factor. But I think that recent studies at Tel al Daba and the Sinai Peninsula actually reveal aspects of the local conditions that Gardner did not know about. And to my mind, these studies really encourage us to revise our interpretation of the changes that were happening in this area. So coming back to our late 18th dynasty map, we may note a curious feature, which is near to the old palatial complex and running partly parallel with it a new fortification arose along the southwest to northeast axis. This wall, which may date to the pharaoh Horemheb, passed through the old palace quarter and apparently crossed that channel of the Nile before terminating on the northern island of Tel al Daba. This wall is curious. Why would the Egyptians intentionally block a river channel, particularly the channel that fed the major harbor of the town? Well, recently, geograph geophysical surveys in this region suggest that part of the problem actually lay with the harbour itself. So in the early 2000s, a French team conducted core drillings across the landscape of central Tel al Daba. I've highlighted some of the drill spots here on the left. This is the, the grey area is the rough island of the site. The black is the um, ancient river and the white spots are the main, main concentrations of core drillings. Now, the results from this study or these studies show a historical period that is marked by increasing sedimentation, particularly in the Nile channel, and especially in that channel across which Horemheb built his wall. On, the, on this image, it's the white dot labeled AV17. So in other words, this channel may have actually blocked up with silts over time around this period, and that may have rendered it inaccessible. Simultaneously, the southeastern branch, which is F3, also filled with brown and sandy silts. And as a result, it would seem that the main harbor actually lost its two major water channels. And since one of those was a feeder, it would have lost a substantial portion of its volume. To my mind, this loss probably would have been catastrophic from an economic point of view. It would have lowered the harbor's water table and thus reduced its accessibility from the river. It would have reduced its functionality or value as a boat landing spot. And from this, I would suggest that one of the main problems facing Tel al Daba was an environmental one. The city in the short term may have started to fail because changes in the landscape, or particularly the riverscape, rendered that core harbor all but useless to its original function. 
And this might explain why that fortified wall of Horemheb suddenly goes right across the channel, because at this point, that branch may have been defunct, just filled with silt. So we saw earlier how, how under the Hyksos rulers, Tel Al Daba acted as a major economic hub, especially for international trade. The hundreds of ships referenced by Carmoza suggest that the site flourished in large part due to its berthage and its landing areas. And then we also saw how the early palatial complex of the Tutmosid era developed in part as a land reclamation project. And broadly speaking, we could suggest that river frontage was a valuable asset in this, in this part of the city, one that attack, attracted significant royal investment and protection. Well, I wonder if by 1300 BCE, those river advantages were disappearing. A period of increasing sedimentation in the north and eastern parts of the city may have reduced access to that harbour basin. It's possible that this problem became so acute that eventually the northern channel K3 was entirely blocked and builders working under Horemheb or approximately were able to extend a wall across the channel onto that northern island. Eventually, I suggest the harbour basin itself was accessible only through the eastern channel, so only with difficulty. And it's possible that these changes are pivotal to understanding why Tel El Daba suddenly declined over the course of just 100 years. Now, the changes in topography at Tel El Daba may have been a central factor in the city's decline. The data provided by core drillings do seem to indicate that the basin harbour was disappearing. And if, as I suspect, this harbour was the primary amenity of the site, that might help to explain the decline of the city. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that is the only factor, but I wonder if these topographical changes are more important than we've pre previously acknowledged. Now, I started coming to this conclusion in my research when I, was when I started comparing developments at Tel El Daba to another site. On the edge of the Sinai Peninsula, the site of Tel El Borg provides some contemporary and comparable records for settlement in this area. Now, very quickly, just as we're rounding out this discussion, I'd like to talk about some noteworthy features of Tel El Borg and how they possibly reflect on Tel El Daba. So Tel El Borg was a fortified town of the mid 18th dynasty, although it may have started back in the Hyksos period. Around 1430 BCE, again, that late Tutmosid period, we find a small town developing in this environment. The early settlement of Tel El Borg has two parts, a semi-fortified area in the east, which is fields eight and four, and an open, open domestic area in the west, which is field six. So as a whole, the town occupied two separate hills overlooking a low lying area that seems to have been vulnerable to flooding at certain times of the year. This region had a slightly uncomfortable climate. It has a marshy lagoon to the south and the Mediterranean coast to the north. And according to the excavators, even today, it's quite bleak with cold wind and rain sweeping through, especially in the winter months. So it's not exactly the balmy Mediterranean resort we might imagine. But this coastal location for Tel El Borg was important. Now, the material evidence from the site, summarizing very quickly, suggests again that it was part of that international trade network that really developed in the Second Intermediate Period and New Kingdom. Ceramic remains from the site include sherds of Mycenaean type. There are Canaanite amphorae, especially of a form particular to the Amarna period, and a range of different wares, including Canaanite, Western Desert Oasis ware, Nile silt, and Egyptian Maldi. So basically, Tel Borg seems to be connected to many different regions with shipments and deliveries coming in and out. We also know that the local residents in this site enjoyed a rather rich protein diet. The faunal studies reveal a menu rich in fish, more than 20 types of birds, cattle, pigs, sheep, and goats. There's also local evidence for agriculture in the form of grains, sickle blades, grindstones, bread molds, and all that. So put together, we seem to have a small but productive little community that are partially sustaining themselves while also receiving the products of international trade. Not bad. 
But like Tel El Daba, it seems that the coastal town of Tel El Borg was quite subject to the whims of the Nile. The marshy lake in the south was probably, not confirmed, but probably an outflow of the Pelusiac branch. And that's the same branch that fed Tel El Daba and may have contributed to the degeneration of that city's harbors. Coincidentally, flooding of the lowlands at Tel El Borg does seem to have forced the locals to redevelop parts of their town at different periods. So excavations in the eastern part of Tel El Borg, these green spots marked here, suggest that around 1320 BCE, floodwaters in the area caused a part of the town to collapse. This probably occurred during or soon after the Amana period, because when the locals started to build the new fortification or the new town, they actually used Amana period masonry in the foundations. So we have a nice, you know, nice little sealed, sealed context that gives us a good baseline. Now, the practice of reusing Amana era material seems to date roughly to Horemheb. So we're probably looking at a date of collapse and reconstruction somewhere in that phase, either Horemheb or very early Dynasty 19. So between roughly 1320 and 1280 BCE, the settlement of Tel Borg seems to have needed a large scale redevelopment due to in adverse environmental conditions. The new fortification was on higher ground further east, so they were obviously trying to escape those floodwaters. That seems to have worked for about 200 years and the site continued operating right into the 20th dynasty around 1180 BCE. But after that, it departs from our story and that's probably due to the larger, larger trends of that time, which I won't get into here. But wrapping things up, preliminary research suggests that a broader economic and geographic focus can offer new insights into the development of these urban environments. In particular, I think that a greater emphasis on the landscape itself and the paleogeography can corroborate and expand our understanding of the historical trends. So changes in the ancient environment were apparently, from what we know so far, incredibly important factors to the development of these settlements. And it may have affected their role within the larger Egyptian economy and society quite significantly. Now, Tel Al Daba and Tel Al Borg and their neighboring towns perhaps offer some preliminary evidence for the physical and social influences that were shaping and reshaping their communities. So let's bring this all together. How does it all, how does it all patch up? So between 1560 BCE and approximately 1300, the cityscape of Tel al-Daba or Avaris underwent a sustained period of intense urban development and then a period of redevelopment and decline. First, we see suburbs gathering, clustering together, growing denser, then they disappear. Enclosed areas like palatial complexes developed on reclaimed land and they left remarkable testimony of intercultural contacts. But even then, those tended to be demolished and replaced by new things over a few generations. It essentially seems that we have a sort of small story arc for Tel El Daba as a physical and domestic environment. The environmental changes, I think, probably destroyed one of the most important assets that made Tel El Daba an attractive site. The Nile River may have silted up in certain parts and eventually led to the collapse or draining of the city's main harbor. As a result, the primary landing space and perhaps the epicenter for the city's trade and transport network may have become largely inaccessible. And I don't think it's a coincidence that soon after that happens, the city itself dwindles rapidly in prominence until it becomes effectively a southern suburb of P. Ramesses to the north. Now, these changes that we see at Tel Al Daba may have happened in other places as well. Tel Al Borg, not far to the east and possibly attached to the same branch of the Nile, experienced at least one period of high flooding that collapsed part of the town, and thus required a large scale reconstruction on higher ground. Now, fortunately, Tel Al Borg survives quite well and leaves a lot of really detailed evidence for us, 
but effectively we get a similar trajectory in a sense of a rise and fall with many factors of environmental conditions affecting the settlement. So this discussion is a small portion of my larger PhD research. Studies of urbanism and the socioeconomic or geographical components are still relatively young in Egyptology. And historically, I would say that scholars have focused on these regions and this time period, and particularly the settlements, less as dynamic communities and more as expressions of military or political factors. I think if we move past that trend, there is a good basis for examining these sites in greater depth from socioeconomic and geographical perspectives. They're not just army depots or bases. These settlements are living and dynamic and their inhabitants responded to changes in their environment. And it's possible that communities could rise and fall on the success of these responses and the local conditions. So with further research and greater emphasis on the micro details of all this, I'm hopeful that we can offer some broad revisions to our understanding of these sites and their place in the study of ancient urban archeology. span Hopefully my future research will allow me to expand some of these hypotheses with more detail, more comparative data, and ultimately build a more cohesive and holistic picture of settlements in the North. So that brings me to the end of my presentation and thank you all for listening.